Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Headline Books Christmas Extravaganza session. We are meeting our authors all week long, and today we have Headline Books' first children's book author joining us, Melinda Chambers, to share her Back to Nature series with us. Welcome, Melinda. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. So happy, yes, we're so happy that you're here. And if any of you all have questions for Melinda that you would like to have answered at the end of the session, you can feel free to type them into the comments section under this video. And we'll do a short Q&A at the end. Also, if you're interested in purchasing any of the books that we talk about today, there is um, there will be links for those books in the comments as well. So again, we're really happy that all of you have joined us today for our Back to Nature series. And I'm going to kick it over to Melinda to get us started. Okay, thank you, Ashley. I didn't know that I could actually write a book until I was a grandmother. And my sister-in-law, Sue Ann Spiker, who married my brother, uh, we were both reading to our grandkids and we just looked at each other and thought, you know, it would really be nice to have our own books to do this because they don't seem to be that hard. And she said, well, I could write. So we just sort of looked at each other and I said, how about I send you a story and you draw the pictures? And that's what we did. And by the next Christmas, we were reading our book to our grandkids. So that's kind of how this started. I was sorry I didn't realize I could do this before then, but um, I didn't know anybody who was an author. I didn't really know anything. Um, but I did know I loved to read and that was a big reason why I wanted to get her books so valuable to me as I was growing up. And um, I spent a lot of time in the library. Well, the books that I remember the most were the books that had a purpose, a meaning, that I really learned something when I was done. Um, and I really, I like nature. I like to go on walks. I like to observe things. I'm um, just watching nature do its things it's amazing and my husband and I would go and walk and we'd walk I noticed in particular the blue jays they were bossy they're just plain bossy and they traveled in groups and then we had a sparrow that would sing it was it was on our um, basketball net and it would sing there every day every day every day but the sparrows kind of plain, nobody really looks at them, they're just plain. But they're beautiful in what they say. And they don't ask for anything, whereas a sparrow, I mean a blue jay, just squawks. But people will look at them, because people were that way too sometimes. Um, so I'm thinking in parable, all right, I know a few blue jays. They're just, you know, they're pretty, but they're not nice. And then I know a lot of sparrows who aren't necessarily beauty queens, but they're as nice as can be. So that was the beginning of this book, actually. Um, the book cover, which my sister-in-law did, which I really love. You know, when you start out a book, you have to decide, well, who's gonna tell the book? And I thought, well, it's gotta be an owl because an owl is wise. We all know that, an owl is wise. But an owl sleeps at night in my book, he needed to be awake. So I had to get a reason for him to get awake. And then I needed to have more birds than just the um, blue jays and the sparrows. So I worked on that too. Now, Sue Ann lives a good ways away from me. So I just sent her the story. But that was with the pictures exactly the way I wanted them, which was nice. She just read my mind. So. And Ashley is going to get up some of this book here. Uh, we are who we are. And the next page dedicated to grandchildren, yours and mine. And that I took very seriously because that was the beginning of our reason for writing books was for the grandkids, but then everybody's grandkids. And of course, my grandkids now are too old to read this, but I have found in the process that there's really no age link to this. I've read this to my middle schoolers. I've read it to high school. I've read it to adults and they've all gained from it because there's a lot of wisdom from the owl. 
So I'm only going to tell the story in my own words, but I want you to see the pretty pictures. So the owl is returning to it's placed in the tree, been hunting all night, and he comes to see his his son. And his son, who has a big eye, is really anxious to find out all the stuff that that's going on in the daytime when he's awake. And the father owl really doesn't want to talk now because he wants to sleep. And so the son is trying to get him awake. Now, one of my favorite pictures is the one with the uh, the one eye open and the one eye closed, because that's how some people are, <laughs> sometimes me. Um, so he keeps having to punch him. And the father says, that's the wake up call in the morning for sounding to hear in the woods. And then he sees something funny on the ground. This pretty bird is has his head cocked to the ground and he's wondering what he's doing while well, he's listening for this worm. And it's like, well, what does he want a worm for? He says, well, he pulls the worm out of the ground once he hears it, and then he chops it up into little pieces, and then he feeds it to his hungry baby. Uh, so right archers of the woods, um, because they take care of their young and they, they give them everything that they need. And um, they're just a motherly kind of type of bird. And they're also very pretty. Okay, well then it's starting to get a little bit quieter. And the, the little son decides that he's gonna make some noises trying to learn how to hoot. Well then he hears hooting in the background and he knows it's not him. And it's like, well, everything he says they say, well, here it's mockingbirds, and they repeat everything they hear. Their owl says, yes, they haven't had a good idea of their own since I've known them. So they're just kind of the gossips of the forest. And then as they get all snuggled into their um, tree nest, they start hearing beautiful, beautiful music. And that's the song of the sparrows. And so the sun looks in there, well, what bird has the prettiest song? And he says, well, I really think it's the sparrows because they just sing and sing for no reason and they're so pretty. They're awake and they hear some noises beneath them. They um, wonder what's going on. And it's these big old birds and they're your vultures. And even though they're not the prettiest things in the world, the, the Father Al, in his, all his great wisdom, is saying, well, you know, they help to keep the forest clean. They're essential to all parts of the woods. They get rid of all the dead stuff and the smelly stuff, and, and then it's back to normal. So they're an important part. The little boy hears a beautiful sound and a beautiful bird, and he wonders, what is that? And the father says, oh, we're indeed lucky to see these. These are the bluebirds. You don't always see them, but uh, when you do, um, they make you happy. And so a lot of people say that this is happy as a bluebird, um, cheerful as a bluebird. And so the uh, sun is just dancing on the branch of the tree because there's people I call blue, bluebirds too that, that make me happy. They're just make a person happy to be there. <clears throat> now we get to the blue jays. This is my way of getting back at them. I love the picture that Sue Ann did of the blue jays because that that's really them. <clears throat> if you watch them in a bird feeder, they scare off all the other birds. Let me get some water here. So the bluebirds um, are mean, even though they're pretty, uh, and they always travel in packs. Well, the son thinks he'd like to be a blue jay because they are pretty, but the father says, no, I don't think you want to be them. So then it's evening and he hears the sounds, the peaceful sounds of the morning doves, and they bring uh, peace back into the woods and all is well. And it's getting about evening time for the father to head out again on the is not nightly. And then he sees a boy going through the woods, and that's a new creature. So 
he tries to keep his father there on the limb so he can find out about what this boy is doing. He said, well, that's a human. He said, they're different than birds. All the birds are who they are because that's the way they were meant to be. But a boy is different because he can make choices. He can choose to be happy like the, the bluebirds or nurturing like the robin or a wake-up call, be a bully like the blue jays, or be gossips like the mockingbirds. He has a choice there. And so that's really big news to the, the son, the owlet. And um, he says, well, they're so lucky. If, if they can choose, I'll bet there aren't any blue jays or mockingbirds in the people world. And so the father says, you know, that's the strangest thing of all, as he flies away into the night sky. Sometimes people make the bad choices and you have to wonder, choose that. But they're not born that way, the way the birds are. So this is a good discussion piece with kids and with really with anybody. Um, if you're being bullied or if you are the bully, you can say, you know, why did you choose that? And you can choose to not be. You can, it's up to you and the person you decide to be uh, will make a difference in, in who you become. So much wisdom in this book. Um, Melinda, well, so all that was, I was going to say, all that came from just looking at birds and comparing them to people. Now, what were you saying? I was going to say, well, Ashley is getting the next book ready. Um, I know that you were in New York at Book Expo America and you signed in the Mom's Choice Award booth and the author autographing area. Would you like to tell people what that experience was like? Well, um, it was exciting to be around other authors. I knew I didn't ever want to live in New York. I'm a, not a New York person. I'm really glad that publishing companies don't have to be in New York. You can, you know, as long as you have the right equipment, you can be anywhere you want to be. That's nice. Um, but New York was fun. It was expensive to my taste. Um, but the biggest thing was meeting the people. But I love books and I always had long lines and um, people seemed really pleased to get the books um, and it, any author is gonna be glad that people appreciate what you've done. It's just that appreciation that you um, need to know that you, you know it's a benefit to somebody else. That's true. <clears throat> and here we are with the second book in the series, The Day the Snapdragons Snap Back. So I'll give it back to Melinda. Well, now this history is an interesting one as well. And, and my books start in funny ways. For example, the last book I read, I had the ending before I had the beginning. Now in this book, it was a true story about me. So it didn't take long at all to write it um, once I figured out who was going to tell the story um, because this happened and I knew right away that that was a good book. I had planted Snapdragons, um, which I really like Snapdragons. And I'd planted them in my garden and they were ready to come up and then right when the rate of blue came around and ate everything up, the little stems sticking out of the ground. And I was so upset that I said I wouldn't plant them anymore. But they came up again with the help of the sun and the rain and they were everywhere. And I thought, well, that's kind of how people are, particularly kids, you know, you work with them, you try to teach them and you think they're not listening to a thing and you think all that works in vain. And then all of a sudden, you're just so proud of them because they really did listen to you. So that was kind of where I was coming from with this story. And the story isn't very long, but it's a good story. It's punch, you know, it has a good punch to it with um, of what it's about. Now, I picked the Beagle to tell the story because when you're an author, you can use whatever you want to tell the story. You can use whatever names you want to use. It's fun to be an author because you're in charge. It was dedicated to your future. May you cultivate what life has in store for you in colors. 
just like the snapdragon. Now the mother beagle is telling her son, quit digging up the flowers. If I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times, you can't dig in Beulah's flower bed. But I buried a bone in here last week and I want it. Miss Beulah will be quite upset with you when she sees what you've done to her beautiful flowers. Oh, Beulah's too nice to be mad for very long. But so cute to yell at, and they're just flowers. She won't miss a few. Oh, you young pups are all alike. You think you just do anything you want, and nothing bad happens. But sometimes things happen that you don't expect, that you can't change. You need to be prepared. Come sit with me, and I'll tell you a story. Finding the last bone and eager, the last bone and eager to grow, to gnaw on it for a while. The pup smuggled snuggled here. <laughs> the pup snuggled up to his mom and was all ears. Back before you were born, in fact, I wasn't very old myself. I watched as Beulah planted some snapdragons in her flower bed. Now, see, Beulah is really me. Every morning, she checked on them and watered them if they needed it, removed the weeds from around them, and gave them fertilizer to help them grow. And with such good care, it wasn't long before they started, but little did she know that disaster was looming just around the corner. One morning, real early, just as the buds were beginning to spring into beautiful flowers, a couple of chipmunks came through and terrorized the flower bed. They grabbed those flowers and started to whittle them just above the surface of the ground, taking the buds with them. When Beulah came out to water her flowers later that morning, she couldn't believe what she saw. All that was left of her beautiful snapdragons was still the ground. Gone are blooms that Beulah planned to enjoy all summer. Gone were the rewards from her hard work. Gone were her dreams. Wiping away her tears, she went back inside, vowing never to plant snapdragons again. Poor Beulah. What happened then? asked the puppy. Every morning I checked on those snapdragons or what was left of them and started to grow back. With the help of the summer rains and the warm sun, the meager stems were transformed. In no time, it seemed like snapdragons had snapped back. In fact, there were snapdragons everywhere. Well, Even though the chipmunk, the little puppy says, well, how did they do that? He says, well, even though the chipmunks took away the plant that showed on the surface, they didn't get to the roots. And that was it. With the help from nature, the plant was able to come back. And this time, even sturdier than it was before. What did Beulah do when she saw them? Ah, oh, that was a glorious day indeed. Once again, she wiped away her tears, but this time they were tears of joy. You see, because she'd taken such good care of these plants before the chipmunks showed up, their root system was very strong. Oh, is that why care of me and teach me right from wrong? Yes, if you learn all you can and try real hard to be the best you can be, and if something happens that sets you back, you don't have to give up. You have a strong foundation. And with the help of those around you, you can snap back even better than before. Gee, Mom, I thought life was supposed to be easy. Life is good. Well, I better put this dirt back before Beulah sees the mess I made. Good thinking. Say, when you're done, let's see if we can find some chipmunks to chase. So the end 
chasing those old chipmunks. This book, even though it's not a lot of words, it says a lot because so many people, kids in particular, they have a lot to deal with. It may be or uh, moves they don't want to make, or maybe they're having trouble at school. There's just, they have a lot of baggage. And some people, you know, they can snap out of this and others can't, and they, we need each other. And so this is showing that we all need to help each other, uh, support them and to help people to be strong enough to come back even when hardship is there. So I like that. My next one is Freddy Cat. I had a little afraid of cat here. And you're going to say, well, why didn't you have a real cat? And I said, well, you know, I would, but it was afraid, too, too afraid to come out. <laughs> so this one I keep under my tree. <clears throat> anyway, afraid of cat on that picture definitely looks afraid. And it's the cover that sells a lot of books. Again, my artist is Sue Ann. <clears throat> she keeps cats everywhere as well. Now, I dedicated this book to those who've discovered it's to leave from the safety of your shelf to get where you want to be. Now, I'm not going to read this word for word. I'm going to kind of skim it a little bit just to give you the, uh, the idea of it. The mother cat had her kittens on a shelf in a barn, and that was a very comfortable place for that to happen. Uh, but of course they wouldn't stay there all the time. So the mother kitten is trying to, um, as her kittens grow up, to let them see the big, big world. So she has them floor the barn. But Freddy, you see those big eyes again, she didn't want to go anywhere. She wanted to stay right there in that comfort of her shelf. And so then the mother sends her little kittens outside to see what all is uh, exciting there. And they're just really pleased to see the great big world that's out there. They had fun in the barn, they have fun outside. Um, the farmer with the cow that he's, he's milking the cow and he occasionally squirts so that they can get a little bit of milk in their mouths. That was great fun for them. Um, they, they're just having a barrel of fun. And before they know it, it's nighttime again and time to go back up to their shelf. Well, they can hardly wait to tell Freddy about all the things that they saw. And Freddy was glad to hear those things, but had no intention of going with them because of all the what ifs. Well, what if I get hurt? What if something happens? What if I can't find my way back? What, you know, what if, what if? And, and it was getting annoying because it's like, well, sure, stuff happens, but we're there. We can help you through it. Um, you know, you just gotta gotta make that big leap or you won't find out anything. But Freddy says, I'm really comfortable here. This is my comfort zone and, and I'm just cozy. I'll stay here a while longer. So the next day when the rooster crows, the kittens are out and about looking all over the place, but Freddy stayed on her shelf when again but she did her that was playing on the side of the barn and it was doing some odd things it was building a nest out of mud and it was taking one mud arch at a time and building it up into a tunnel thought well that's strange and so she kept watching it and it would keep making trips out the barn in the barn and it would have narrow dodges of the cow's tail um, he had to be very careful to get back to the nest, um, but he always made it and it continued with the nest. And so then Freddy's wondering, well, what's it doing in the nest? And so she studied it some more and she noticed that the mud dauber was getting spiders and paralyzing them and putting them in the nest. I thought, well, that's really cool. So it took her all day to be occupied with the mud dauber. And meanwhile, the kittens came back. The Freddy just, after she ate, she just kept her eyes awake thinking about all the things she had just seen. So sleep was really hard for her to find that night. And the next day, the mud dauber continued making mud 
with the, its little the hands and sticking more spiders in and then laying an egg in the in the tunnel so that when the egg hatched the larva could eat eat the spiders and which is why you see mud daubers and spiders in the same location. Interesting. But then one day the mud dauber stops and looks at Freddy. The mud dauber hadn't failed to notice that Freddy hadn't moved. So it looks at her and said, well, you know, if you're going to go anywhere, you're going to have to go somewhere. At some point in your life, you're going to have to get off this shelf. Well, Freddy knew she was right. And so Freddy, with a deep breath, jumps down that ledge. And it wasn't so far. Of course, by this time she was bigger. I wonder, well, why did it take me so long to do that? And this really is an awesome place. Golly, my, my siblings were right. How did I miss out on all this stuff? And so the rest of the summer, Freddy remained on the ground um, playing with the other kittens. But in the end of the summer, Freddy had become top cat because she had gained the wisdom that she had needed when she realized that she had to go somewhere. And this is an important lesson for all of us because we all suffer from the what ifs. You know, this COVID stress that we're in now, we have a lot of what ifs there. We don't know our future. We don't know what's going to happen, but we make the best of it and we move on and, and um, um, make a safe place for ourselves, but not stay in the same place. So Life continues, and that's sort of the story of Freddy Cat. Now, oh no, Freddy Cat was um, written because of the mud dauber. That's how I started that one. But Chili Billy started because of the name. I had a title, that's all I had. Well, then I thought, well, the book has to be about a goat because I said the word Billy, but I didn't know anything about goats. I raised sheep. So then finally it occurred to me I needed to write about sheep. So I knew what I was talking about. An author always needs to know what they're talking about. You don't want to be saying wrong things. It started out as being Silly Billy, but then I noticed that a lot of books had that name. So I needed to change it a little bit. Silly Billy. <clears throat> and then I needed to, to make him chilly. So we'll see how I did that. This book took longer to write because I needed to be, <clears throat> to just develop it. Um, and authors sometimes bruise the story in their minds before they can write it. I brewed it for five years and then I wrote it in two hours. Things have a funny way of happening with stories. Okay, the, the funny picture, Ashley, you can go back to the funny picture before this. You can turn back where you were. There you go. The black and white pictures. Uh, the one on the left's my brother and the one on the right's me when we were holding little lambs. And then to the, the second picture, I'm on the left and my brother's on the right. And we showed at, um, the state fair. So <clears throat> we enjoyed our lambs, our sheep. And the farmer in the book is named Lynn, which was my dad's name, so I, I wrote it in memory of him, but dedicated it to those who choose not to be swayed by their peers to do things they know they shouldn't, because really the book is on peer pressure, even though you think it's about lambs. My artist friend, Sue Ann Maxwell Spiker, on as the um, person to the draw when she was doing this. It was their barn and her son. So that helped her with, with the, the pictures and they raised sheep as well. So all these beautiful pictures are um, in watercolor and really I don't know how she does it, but she's awesome. So it was a very cold night in the middle of January and lambs seemed to come on the coldest night. They went really cold, and this is kind of what was happening. Farmer Lynn knew that lambs would come soon, and he knew with this being a cold night, he better go 
spend the night in the barn. So as he opened up the barn door, he saw already the one lamb had been born and its ears had already had icicles in it and the lamb was busy trying to lick off all of the ice. And so it was gonna need some more assistance. Uh, so he hugged the lamb with his parka to try to get it warmer, the, the lamb to nurse. And that made it um, his belly warm up as well. There's a lot of nurturing when it comes to farm animals and it's always nice if a, a farmer can be there to assist. Now, usually uh, farmers don't name their animals, but this one he felt he needed to because it was born in such a cold night. So he named it Chili Billy, whereas the other lambs just had numbers. Well, as the lambs got older and yielded, and if you've ever seen lambs playing out in the field, they jump around, they have a lot of fun. They jump up on, on four legs, four stiff legs. And then there's usually a dog around to help keep them in the, where they belong. Well, each day is a new adventure. But one of the lambs was wondering about what was going on on the other side of the fence. They all had a fence, but that grass on the other side of the fence looked awfully good. So um, himself, he saw get over there. So he studies that fence and he sees a place low that he can get under. And sure enough, he crawls under the fence and gets through. Well, when the other lambs see him doing that and that he's over on the other side of the fence, well, that looks like fun. So they crawl under the fence too. It's like, I'm just going to follow him. And so off they go. And there's a path there to start with. Now you gotta remember Chili Billy being older and wiser. He knew there was a reason for that fence. It wasn't there just for its looks, it was there for protection. But all the other lambs went through and sheep, one follows after another. And the one at the end really doesn't know where he's going or why he's going there. He's just following the one in front of him. And Basically, none of them know where they're going except the one in the front. Then they follow along and follow along this, and they go around the bin evening, and their bellies are getting hungry. And they're not real sure where the path is anymore. And then they hear coyotes. Now, they know coyotes are a danger. Their mamas had already told them that. And they knew they were in trouble because they couldn't see their mamas. They couldn't see Chili Billy. They couldn't see the dog. Oh, they had gotten themselves into a mess of trouble. Well, then they start blaming each other. Well, well I just followed. You know, oh, well, no, I just followed the other person who was supposed to know what they were doing. Well, then nobody knew what they were doing. Well, then not really. We just thought we'd go somewhere. Oh. So now back at the farm, the ewes are getting anxious because they don't see their little lambs anywhere and they know that they should be getting hungry. Well, then the farmer comes around and looks around and doesn't see any lambs. So he sees Chili Billy and he sees his dog. And so he takes them out because he thinks that they're gonna know where they are. And sure enough, they lead the farmer to where these sheep are, clear on the other side of the hill. Well, when the lambs heard them coming, they were so glad, so glad. And that dear sweet lamb, Chilly Billy, that they had made fun of him earlier, calling him a silly Billy because he didn't follow them. There was no silly Billy in him. So they were just glad. glad to have them. So the farmer and the dog and Chili back to the barn and to the safety of their mamas. And they decided that this is where we need to be. That, you know, that fence is indeed made for a purpose. And Shep stayed at the doorway to make sure that there were no escapees. And then Chili Billy had to think back on this, said, sometimes you need to separate yourself from the flock and be your own person. And once he realized this, he was asleep. 
So this is a good way to teach about being your own person and not following the crowds and not doing things just because other people are doing them. And if some people makes fun of you, well, that's okay because you know you're doing the right thing. Um, they will look up to you in the future. So always make your judgments that are based on sound decisions. Another good way to teach a good lesson. Um, now I taught middle school, but when I would read my books to them and you think, well, these are children's books. I don't think middle school would really like them. You would be surprised. They enjoyed being read to and they listened to these animals. Um, and they did understand exactly the lesson I was trying to do. And it was much more effective than me trying to teach them about peer pressure and bullies and, and all the lessons that they needed to know for character building. The books really served a perfect teacher or a parent or a grandparent. All these can be used to um, better understand your children and to, to have a conversation with your children and give support to them in, in all the issues that we all have. So I've enjoyed doing these stories. Um, I will continue to do stories. I'm currently starting to write a, a novel, which again has a good moral meaning to it starts out with a child growing up in the 50s but ends in a much different world than it began um, so it has a, an interesting story too that I hope that you will read um, try to get after Christmas that I'm sure Kathy will be sending out and maybe I'll do another one of these um, little zoom things at that time so how was that Kathy you did a great job, Melinda. Um, I have a couple. I did want to be sure that we let everybody know watching on Facebook that you will be hopefully signing books at the Greenbrier in White Sulphur Springs, um, December 4th and 5th, uh, COVID and the weather permitting, right? Right. Um, sometimes the roads are too bad, but this year, I'm just hoping that everything will stay open to the point where I can go and also that I don't get sick. Right. That's I, you know, what the future will be, but we just go. I'm just like that little cat on the shelf. I, I've got to jump down. I can't just stay up there forever and ever. Uh, I got to go somewhere to get somewhere. So I'm going to try that and hopefully I'll be there. Uh, they are very good about selling my books and they do have my books right now. So the plan is for me to be there. It'll be in the toy shop. Um, I've had my books there for several years and they're very good at, at selling my books there. Yes. Books are also at Tamarack by the ones anytime and you happen to be by there. You can look for them there too. They are. they are. And another unique thing that you have done with your books is that you were on Lifetime Television. That was a few years ago. Um, would you like to tell us about that? Well, there was funny stories about that trip. <clears throat> My husband who didn't do 10 lanes of highway very well. <laughs> he was, it was hard on him to have all that traffic there. Like again, we are country people. But um, I wanted to find out where I was going. So we were traveling around getting our um, destination, <clears throat> destinations in order. Uh, once we figured that out and then um, got there, then they put makeup on me and, and they really put makeup on me. I was just so pretty. I had all this glob of stuff in my eyes and, and really... I could hardly, everything was over. The first thing I did was to, to wash all that off because it was so itchy. <laughs> I don't wear makeup like that. So I really don't know how they, they do it. But, um, but it was a fun experience to say that I was indeed on national TV, um, getting to talk about my books and they did like my books. Um, and it was in Florida. We went up to Florida down there to do it. So it, it was fun. 
I'm doing this, this book thing has just been really fun for me. It's led me to a lot of different um, avenues. I've met a lot of people, but I will have to say my biggest joy with my books, and this is absolutely the truth, my biggest joy has been the faces of the kids. And if they've read it and they find it, out that excited and, and if I can put their name in a book for them they get excited it's just seeing that excitement that that's their book um, and that's what it's all about that's why we write just for the people who are reading them absolutely very well said Melinda and as always we love having you on our program here and we appreciate you stopping by here before the holidays kind of kick off um, again, if any of you want, would like to have copies of the books uh, discussed today, there are links here in the comments section for you to find those. So uh, from everybody at Headline Books, we wish you a happy and safe and healthy holiday season, Melinda, and we hope that you come back on Zoom Into Books. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>